Hello, this is the daily COVID update from Deccan Herald. I'm Suraksha. On the bulletin today, Karnataka reports three new cases of COVID-19. Mumbai announces multiple strategies to deal with the rise in cases. And Amulya takes a look at a few countries which have been making some rather unpopular choices while dealing with the pandemic. But first, a look at the national numbers. More than 27,000 cases of COVID-19 have been reported in the country so far. Over 20,000 people are active carriers. More than 6,000 patients have recovered since they were first tested and the country has registered 876 deaths so far. The Indian Council of Medical Research has collected more than 6 lakh samples for testing from across the country till date. Karnataka has reported three new cases today and one death. Of the 302 active cases, six are in the ICU. 182 people have recovered and have been discharged so far and the state has seen 19 deaths. Patient 465, a 45-year-old woman and a resident of Bengaluru died earlier today. She had been diagnosed with severe acute respiratory illness and had a history of pneumonia and tuberculosis. She was also a known diabetic. After reporting 44 cases a few days ago, the state has three new cases today. Two cases have come in from Kalburgi, both are contacts of previously diagnosed patients and one from Dakshina Kannada district. A quick look at the rest of the states. At 440 cases, Maharashtra recorded far fewer cases today compared to the last few days. The state reported 19 deaths today and has more than 6,500 active cases. Gujarat and Delhi are in the second and third spot. In national news, as Maharashtra struggles to contain the number of COVID-19 cases in the state, the focus has turned to Dharavi, Asia's biggest slum cluster which houses close to 10 lakh people in just over two square kilometers. The state government and the Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai have come out with a multi-pronged strategy to contain the spread. These include plans to distribute hydroxychloroquine tablets to people in the containment zones, pool testing and plasma therapy. Family members and close contacts of positive patients who are currently under home quarantine will be sent to institutional quarantine. Fever camps have been set up and door-to-door screening is also underway. A 300-bed quarantine centre, Rajiv Gandhi Sports Complex, is operational and a 600-bed facility is being created in Dharavi Municipal School. Approximately 250 cases and 14 deaths have been reported from Dharavi. In the national capital, Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has allowed standalone shops to reopen following the lockdown relaxation provided by the Ministry of Home Affairs but has refused to allow other sectors like construction to resume operations. Malls and market complexes will remain shut. The rate of infection of COVID-19 cases appears to be slowing down in Delhi. The capital recorded 850 cases in the seventh week which dropped to 624 cases the following week. There is some good news coming in from the northeast. All the positive persons in three states, Tripura, Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh have recovered. In Assam, 27 of the 34 positive persons have also recovered and have been discharged from hospitals. No fresh case has been reported in the past 72 hours. With just a week to go before the lockdown ends, the Right to Food campaign has urged the government not to extend the lockdown beyond May 3rd, saying the social and economic consequences of continuing such blanket measures are too high and cannot be justified. Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be holding a video conference with chief ministers tomorrow to review the progress so far and decide on the lockdown. Some of the chief ministers are of the view that the lockdown must be extended beyond May 3rd. The campaign reports that at least 270 people have died due to hunger, exhaustion, state violence, suicides and inability to access health care during lockdown. Health care infrastructure is out of bounds for several sick people due to their inability to reach these facilities and several of these facilities are non-functional. CPIM General Secretary Sitaram Yechiri has accused, has accused the central government of squeezing the states financially even as the centre is going ahead with the central VISTA project along with a new residence for the Prime Minister at the time of economic distress. He pointed out that states have not yet received the out outstanding dues from the GST collection and that the centre must be liberal in transferring funds to them. He also criticised the number of explanations issued after each order saying it pointed to incompetence in governance. Despite the Ministry of Home Affairs advisory that technicians can resume services, a disruption of the supply chain has meant that many of them have been unable to repair household goods like ACs and refrigerators. Most spare parts are unavailable as shops are closed or the supply chain has been disrupted. Most southern Indian states are well into peak summer. The Indian Cellular and Electronics Association has estimated that almost 4 crore mobile phone users in the country will be without a handset by May end due to falls and breakdowns in case the lockdown continues. The association believes that if there is a 0.25% chance of a breakdown on a monthly basis, nearly 2.5 crore individuals will suffer as a result due to non-availability of new devices. Repair of their existing devices is also 
hampered as the supply chain is affected. Some district administrations have made the government's Arogya Setu app mandatory for those who venture out of their homes, making it challenging for those who do not have smartphones. ICEA has said that it has made a joint representation to multiple ministries, including the Home Ministry, to include mobile devices, including laptops, in the list of essential goods, but the MHA is yet to accept it. In news from Karnataka, Kasturba Medical College Hospital at Manipal and Udupi district has decided to resume normal outpatient department services for all specialties from Monday. OPD services will be available from 8.30 to 1 in the afternoon. Patients will be allowed to enter once they have been screened outside the hospital. One attender can accompany the patient and masks are mandatory. Trauma and emergency services will function as usual. In our weekly international news segment last week, we looked at how two European countries, France and Germany, had reacted to the pandemic and the difference it had made to the outcome. This week, Amulia tracks some of the nations who differ from the lockdown approach and for better or worse, are convinced that they are on the right track. Amulia, what have you got for us today? As of this weekend, the number of people infected with the novel coronavirus has crossed the 2 million mark. While many countries across the world have seen lockdown as the best option to contain the spread and not overwhelm the healthcare system, there are some countries that seem to have taken slightly different approaches. Sweden has been attracting a lot of attention internationally for its relatively lax strategy to contain the virus, while its neighbours Denmark, Finland and Norway have closed down schools, work and borders, Sweden has not enforced lockdown or any such strict measures. Instead of ordering, it has asked people over 70 and are feeling unwell to stay at home and has restricted gatherings over 50 people. It has also asked its citizens to maintain social distancing. In a country of 10 million, Sweden has recorded 17,567 cases and 2,152 deaths due to COVID-19. This is much higher than its neighbours like Norway and Finland, whose number of deaths stand at 181 and 94 respectively. But unlike many countries who count only hospital deaths, Sweden does include deaths at elderly care homes, which account for 50% of all deaths in the country. And as pregnant, Sweden's chief epidemiologist overseeing the government's response to COVID-19 has said that the government should allow the virus to spread slowly through the population. This is the same approach initially employed by the United Kingdom and, and Netherlands before both countries rapidly changed strategy amid mounting evidence that this approach would still overburden healthcare systems. The strategy in Sweden seems to be that of developing herd immunity in the country, which has been criticized by many within the nation's scientific community. But people themselves seem to be taking precautionary steps. According to a survey quoted in the BBC report, 9 in 10 Swedes are keeping a meter away from people at least some of the time and the use of public transportation has decreased significantly. Swedes have been proactively practicing social distance despite its government's relaxed approach to the crisis. In Brazil, however, everyone knows how serious this infection is, except the leader of the country himself. As the Brazil healthcare system struggles to keep up with the testing, the far-right president Jair Bolsonaro has continuously undermined the disease, calling it the little flu. Recently, he even participated in a pro-dictatorship rally while coughing repeatedly and flouting social distancing norms. Last week, he even fired Health Minister Luis Henrique Mandetta, who had publicly disagreed with him on the coronavirus response of the country. Much like Bolsonaro, Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko has been playing ice hockey matches in packed stadiums and has advised people to drink more vodka to fend off the virus. But none can match that of US President Donald Trump, who entertained the possibility of injecting disinfectants and UV light into the body. If there was ever a time to trust the world's scientific community over democratically elected leaders, then this is it. Certainly looks like it. Thanks for that, Amulya. That's all from us today. Stay safe and for the latest updates, log on to www.deckandherald.com.